On February 23, 1443, in Cluj, Transylvania, a Renaissance legend was born. Matthias of the House Hunyadi, under the parentage of the famous Janos, defender of Christendom Hunyadi, and Erzabet Zilagie. The Hunyadis immigrated from Wallachia over the Carpathian Mountains to Transylvania in the 1390s, in which Matthias' grandfather, Voik Hunyadi, would choose the iconic raven holding a ring as the family sigil, and from then the nickname Corvinus or Corvus, which is Latin for raven, was then given to the Hunyadis. They soon became a notable military family whose career advanced through the defense from the Ottoman Turks, most notably of which Janos Hunyadi, who had fought in one of the most consequential battles in the Balkans on November 10th, 1444, at the Battle of Varna. All right, boys, we're outmanned and outgunned, but not outplanned. As long as we don't do anything stupid, we'll be just fine. <laughs> Those darn Polacks! He also led several defensive counterattacks against the Turks that made the Hanyadi name renowned all throughout Christendom, which would come to serve the Hanyadis well in later years. They were very well adored by locals due to them treating them like actual people. However, many established, old and prestigious Hungarian noble families did not like this unprecedented foreign family's swift rise to power, one of which being the prominent land ranch house of Celia. Matthias' father had a few notable connections to a curious group of humanists, renaissance artists, and the most influential figure of Matthias' early life, a gay poet by the name of Janos Pannonius. These influential characters would tutor Matthias and his older brother Laszlo, as their father would be preoccupied in managing Hungary as regent after King Albert V's death, on top of aiding the defense of Hungarian southern realms from the Ottoman Turks. Six years prior to Matthias' birth, a peasant revolt had shaken Transylvania. It is extremely likely that he may have been witness to the brutality and injustices the peasantry faced that carried its problems into his lifetime, which would come to influence him later in his administration as king. Janos again proving his heroism after lifting the siege of Belgrade and died from a plague that was sweeping throughout the military encampments. This left the Hasburg Ladislaus the posthumous whom Janos was previously regent over to rule over Hungary. As this unfolded, the Count Ulrich II of the aforementioned rival house Celia, in agreement to mend the bonds with the Hunyadis and to put an end to the rivalry, sent his daughter Elisabet Celia to be wedded to Matthias. However, this would prove disastrous as Ulrich's daughter would soon be diagnosed with death at the Hunyad castle. Ulrich used the situation to his own advantage and blamed the new head of the house, Matthias' older brother Laszlo, for unhospitable conditions and mistreatment of his daughter. Ulrich II, Ladislaus, and Laszlo would meet together in Belgrade, November 8, 1456. Laszlo, being aware of Celia's enmity towards him, murdered his rival the day after the meeting. Laszlo showed an astonishing amount of coolness, even giving Laszlo his father's position as captain of the army, as well as inviting the Hinyadis over to Buda to ease his hostility. Glad you guys could make it. Have a seat. No hard feelings, right? Of course not. It's really nice to see you. <laughs> On March 14th, 1457, Ladislaus proceeded to arrest the Hunyadis. Within 48 hours, Laszlo was executed in the palace courtyard of Buda. In the words of Marcus Tanner, the judicial murder of the son of the hero of the siege of Belgrade sent a thrill of horror through the courts of Europe. Everybody was pissed off, from locals in Hungary to the nobles in Italy. Ladislaus' Venetian ambassador reported on June 13th that the king has been abandoned by most of his party. Ladislaus fled in fear of his life to Prague, dragging Matthias along for the ride. After which, he complained of feeling ill, so life gave him something to complain about via death on November 23rd, 1457. In lieu to recent events, after being set free, the King of Bohemia, Jerry Podobra, offered to wed Matthias to his daughter Catherine on May 1st, 1461, in good favor, sealing a truce for some time. Matthias' uncle, Mihai Shilaje, appealed to the Hungarian estate to crown his nephew as King of Bohemia, and thus, at the age of 15, Matthias was made King of Hungary. As Vespiano said, one brother had his head cut off, the other in prison was made king. To be honest, Mihai, did this in order to make Matthias his puppet, but Matthias kicked him off the driver's seat and took uh, the wheel immediately. But you 
wanted to feel power this year. Well, now you're going to feel my power as it surges downward from me, straight through you, from nostril to rectum, now until the end of time. Immediately after Ladislaus's death, Emperor Frederick III von Habsburg of the Holy Roman Empire proclaimed himself the King of Hungary and decided to lead the invasion of Hungary himself on February 27, 1459. And let's just say he's a 251 for a reason. The war was over by May 1459. However, it was later on July 19, 1463, that the Treaty of Vienna Neustadt was ratified, and the conditions were that if Matthias died without an heir, the Hungarian throne would be passed Sometimes to Frederick or his heir. And Frederick agreed to sell the Hungarian crown to Matthias for 80,000 ducats. He had only a few weeks to catch his breath before the next event when the Ottomans invaded Bosnia with some reported 150,000 men, while his uncle decided to mutiny. But Matthias stomped him out, banished him to the front lines, in which he was conveniently decapitated. All the while, a Czech mercenary group under the warlord Jan Jitstra, whom Emperor Frederick III was encouraging, was looting and raiding the northern borders. Matthias had to raise an extraordinary tax to fight in the north and south but he first had to ignore the northern problem and instead was to defend his precious buffer zone that was Bosnia. Then he ping-ponged to Zikres Vehefar to get crowned under the official Hungarian crown, but sadly at this time his Czech wife Catherine died in childbirth along with the child. He then ponged back to Bosnia, somewhat successfully holding back the Turks. Matthias came to the realization that he wasn't going to be able to take on the Turks without help, and help wasn't coming. So he decided to unofficially hold a truce with the Ottomans, putting a pause on crusading the infidels. Hey, I'm tired of fighting. Can we please take a break? Yes, please. Are you guys still fighting? Duke, Duke, yes, Duke, of course. Duke. We are. Okay, just making sure. Okay, I'll throw some jabs your way, and you throw some my way, and we all call it a day. That is fine by me. He then ping-ponged north to deal with the Czech mercs, and within a month, Yiskra yielded to Matthias, after which he raised another, extraordinary tax to hire Yiskra in what would become the foundation of the Black Army. Okay, kid, you got the job. Then the Pope, Paul II, offers Matthias to crusade the Hussites in Bohemia, since Matthias had no truce left. But before doing so, he had to run some errands. First, he re-established the legal system in order for commoners to have much fairer trials, and was thus known to the commoners as Matthias the Just. Second, he hired an expert on money to help him with tax and reforms, a man by the name of Janos Ernest. And before you ask, of course, he's a Jew. Yernus abolished several exemptions that the nobles had squeezed out of earlier kings and introduced new taxes on the basis of the porta, or gate, collected on an annual basis or sometimes more frequently if necessary, and it was often necessary. What's going on? It's money day. Money day? Yeah, I don't know why, but it's been happening a lot lately. Dewey, people don't have money days. I do. It's really neat. There's also cookie days and pat on the head days. I don't like those so much, but before you know it, it's money day again. These reforms turned his annual income from 250,000 ducats up to 800,000 ducats, which didn't make him the richest monarch in Europe by any means, but definitely brought him up to the big leagues. Comparatively, the Venetians were making over a million ducats, and the Ottomans could muster many times that amount by pressing the Tilde key. But Emperor Frederick III, on the other hand, wasn't so well off. When Frederick had journeyed to Rome in 1453 to receive his crown from the Pope in person, he was unable to pay for the entire expedition, and so the Pope had to fork over much of the bill. This new income allowed Matthias to officially establish the infamous Black Army. In 1467, the Transylvanian nobles didn't take too kindly to the reforms and rebelled. But as soon as Matthias started heading over, they vanished like a fart in the wind. The Twain Parent Robert is here for you, Finally, in March 1468, Matthias was finally free to invade Bohemia. He brought up to 16,000 soldiers and half his court to watch the spectacle that was his easy dub. 
He swiftly took Silesia and Moravia, however he couldn't penetrate Bohemia proper due to them turtling in the surrounding mountains. And now you're mine. All mine, you old Hey, get back here, I wasn't done! This tactical shit's getting really old! Now you get out here and fight me blindly like a man! Matthias pulled out of Bohemia for the winter to find better footing in his second campaign into Bohemia. As he resumed in 1469, he was surrounded and captured in Vilimov, but quickly negotiated his release by telling his former father-in-law, the King of Bohemia, Yeri Podibredi, that he would mediate upon his behalf with Pope Paul to ease up on the crusading. Not so big and powerful now, Hungarian. I'll admit it, you got me fair and square. But how about you let me go and I'll tell the Pope to cool it with the whole crusading thing. That sounds amazing. You got yourself a deal. My lead, Matthias would like to discuss an important matter. Okay. What is this about? Yes, first I would like to have your public submission to Rome, then the appointment of Papist Archbishop to Prague, and the nomination of myself to Bohemian what? Throne. No, we had a deal! Sorry, but I don't negotiate with filthy heretics. Upon release, Matthias invited Yuri to his camp only to break his promise and insult him to his face as well as to give him a list of demands. Unsurprisingly, Yuri declined the demands. Matthias then declared himself King of Bohemia in Olmuk on May 3rd, 1469. But realizing that the war was unwinnable and the fact that it had already taken over 400,000 ducats, his advisory became fed up with the war. Matthias was gradually becoming more authoritarian, which led to many disagreements and arguments with said advisors. Matthias went as far as punching his childhood mentor and advisor, Archbishop Witz, in the face in front of everybody. In coming events, the King of Bohemia, Yeri Podibredi, caught a small case of death on March 22, 1471, in which the parliament in Prague confirmed to elect the much-favored Polish candidate, Prince Vladislas, on May 25, 1471 to which he was then crowned on August 22nd. As you can imagine, Matthias was fuming. Matthias requested to marry the daughter of the King of Poland, Casimir IV, but was denied, because much like Frederick III of Austria, he didn't take Matthias seriously. In the background, there was a plot by the Archbishop Witz and some noblemen and council members to invite the Poles to occupy Hungary. But an unknown cleric warned Matthias of the plot in which he rounded up his army and headed back to Buda where he caught the rebels by surprise, and they were thrown into disarray. Matthias then imprisoned the main conspirators and made empty promises such as to never again rule without their counsel. The Polacks then showed up with a force of a mere 12,000 men, and were extremely confused as to the whereabouts of the rebellion they were promised. Matthias' gay poet and childhood mentor Janos Pannonius, who supported the rebellion, opened the gates in order to nudge the Poles into invading. However, the Polacks would simply dissolve by Christmas. Hey, hot stuff, we're ready for you. Uh, is it just you? We we're expecting much more of you. Yeah, but don't worry. I'm more than man enough. No, I think we're fine. Yeah, you are. <laughs> okay, goodbye. Matthias was still looking for a wife, however, which would be easier said than done. He went to the Emperor Frederick III for a marriage proposal in person with an extraordinary entourage including several thousand knights. He brought two brand new lions as a gift and even is going as far as to entertain and honor the emperor with a dance from Matthias himself. Wow, Matthias, what an amazing entourage you have there. I have two kitty cats, they for you. Wow, Matthias, they're so cool. Thanks, Matthias. I want to show you something. Wow, <laughs> Matthias, your, your moves are amazing. Frederick III would seem amused and would continue to lead Matthias on the entire event. Matthias believed he was uh, sincere and was quoted as saying, Now I am with the Emperor in body and soul. <laughs> Gay! But after a while, Matthias realized he was being toyed with and he returned to Hungary extremely upset. Matthias then turned his attention to Italy, in which in the spring of 1474 he found the beauteous Beatrice of Naples, and in September 22nd, 1476, they were wedded. During their wedding ceremony in Buda, there was an important person notably missing from the event, that being Archbishop Bickenslower, 
who defected to the Austrians with 300,000 ducats as well as some books from Matias' own library, after which Frederick III then allies Poland. <laughs> A sweetheart, dear boy, the bluffer fish got away. At this point, Matthias had had enough of Frederick III and declared war on June 12, 1477. Matthias then unleashes the Black Army, in which they then eat up Lower Austria and other parts around Vienna. As a callback to the amount he had to pay to get his crown, Matthias demanded that Frederick III pay him 800,000 ducats to which he settled on 100,000, as well as to recognize Matthias's claim for Bohemia in exchange for a truce. Matthias then needed to fight off the Ottomans in the south, whom had been harassing him this entire time. Matthias arrives in Croatia, fortifies the border, and unleashes Vlad Dracula from captivity, as well as supporting Stefan the Great to fight the Turks. <laughs> Then, in 1481, Mehmed the Conqueror conveniently dies. And fortunately for Matthias, Mehmed's two sons are idiots. The brothers Bezid and Dijim squabble for power between themselves. Dijim attempts to appeal to the West for support and idiotically got himself captured by the Knights Hospital. Hospitality. Shut! 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 <laughs> Matthias then goes back to Bohemia to parlay with Vladislas, in which they both agree to keep the lands that they held and both would then recognize each other as King of Bohemia as truce. As well as making a truce with Poland, which would now free Matthias up for round two with Austria. In January 1482, the Austrians were fed up with the Hungarian bullying and rallied together to fight off the invaders. Matthias once again relied on brute force which his tactics would later be known as shock and awe. He also had a huge siege gun that required 80 horses just to transport it. This time the march to Vienna was a long and slow journey, and there was plenty of protest from the Pope himself against the war and the sheer brutality of the Black Army. But nothing was going to deter Matthias from his bloodthirst for revenge. When Matthias was approaching, Frederick fled to safety and left Vienna to fend for itself. Okay, so this is looking very good. I'm gonna go shopping for some more guys, and I completely expect you to keep everything as is when I come back. Uh, mein Gott, man, we're almost completely surrounded. I have faith in you. Hasta la vista, baby. Matthias then went ahead to conquer everything around Vienna. Then and only then did he proceed to encircle the city itself. The Austrians heard and saw an Ottoman delegation meeting with the Hungarians. Do you see that down there? Yes, what is that? Those are Turks! Perhaps they're here to rescue us! We have arrived to congratulate you on your conquest. Yeah, I'm pretty great, and soon as you can see, I'll be taking Vienna itself. Yes, very impressive indeed. Of course it's impressive to the likes of you. To me, it's simply trivial. Something that you Turks would never be able to do. It would be a long and slow siege. But on May 28th, 1485, the city finally fell to the Raven King. He annexed most of Austria and made Vienna the joint capital of Hungary. He also went ahead and pardoned all the nobles that swore fealty. He then took care of loose ends and was then free to pursue his personal pleasures. He had a project in the works since 1465, that being the Bibliotheca Corviniana, Matthias' greatest works. He contracted countless Italians to hand copy, illuminate, and leather bound countless books to said library. The library ended up being the largest in all of Europe for a time, containing an estimated 2,000 to 2,500 books. This might not seem like much in today's standards, but compared to the most prestigious universities and colleges at the time, such as Cambridge and Oxford, whom of which only possessed about 500 books, he also contracted many more Italians to come to Hungary to build and rebuild the palaces, statues, artwork, and much, much more in Hungary proper. Amidst all of Matthias' greatest achievements, his greatest shortcoming would be his succession. For you see, for all the years he's been married to Beatrice, they had yet to produce an heir. Matthias, at his old age, is fat, ugly, and filled with gout, and he could croak at any time, so in desperation he attempts to assimilate his bastard son John to the throne. I command you 
to swear fealty to my son when I die. Yes, sure, of course, certainly, very well, okay, absolutely, most definitely, assuredly, affirmative, positively, copy that by all means, naturally, you bet. Are you still mad about the whole extraordinary, overwhelming, inconceivable, incomprehensive, ginormous, ravenous taxation? No, negative by no means. Absolutely not. Never. No, not at all. Okay. Hey, I know a poll like that would offer no taxes. All the while, Beatrice is scheming to assume control after Machis' death to absolutely no success. Machis' health began deteriorating more and more and was unable to fully finish assimilating his son to the throne. And finally, in Vienna, 1490, Matthias died suddenly of a stroke. Matthias is dead, justice has fled. That was the phrase that the peasantry used to reflect on his rule and the mistreatment under his successors. The Jewry of Hungary were also now lacking Matthias's protection and would thus be subject to extreme mistreatment by everyone. After his death, the Hungarian nobility proceeded to elect a new king, that being the Polak. King of Bohemia Vladislas, who promised to abolish the taxes that Matthias had placed. John was then shoved down to the Balkans, in which he was made Ban of Croatia and Slovenia, in which he would die much like his grandfather, who died fighting the Turks. He did have two children, but they would also die. That would be the end of the Hunyadi lineage. Beatrice, still scheming, attempted to seduce the new King of Hungary, but she was at this time fat, old, and still infertile. Look at you. Why don't you do something with your life? <laughs> Sit around here all day. You contribute nothing to society. <laughs> You're just taking up space. I mean, how could I be with someone like you? <laughs> and respect myself. The rejection was flat, and so she would move back to Italy and would die off camera. Matthias accomplished many things in his life. An efficient statesman, master tactician, and above all, a true renaissance king. From rags to riches, he managed to elevate Hungary to a prestigious and notable European power. Always being mindful of the little guys, he would often dress in civilian clothing, and in disguise he would find and correct any wrongs or injustice he would come across. And the infamous Black Army, which would be one of Europe's first attempts at a standing army since the collapse of the Roman Empire. With his love for knowledge and his insatiable ambition, he made Hungary the first to experience the Renaissance outside of Italy. However, all of his work would be swiftly undone via the sheer incompetence of his successors and the withering of war and time. When Vladislas diminished the wealth of Hungary, he was unable to afford basically anything. He was so poor, he had to sell books out of the Grand Library and even gave them away to visitors. The Black Army was thus disbanded, as well as many of the forts along the Balkan border, which would lead Hungary to be open to a catastrophic invasion by Suleiman the Magnificent, which would then lead to the siege and pillaging of Buda. Despite Suleiman's best effort to protect the library and palace, his men got to it first and looted and razed everything. Anything that managed to survive the next few hundred years would then be subject to the world wars along with the USSR and mostly Romanian nationalists that just so happened to hate Hungarians and anything positive about Hungarian history, or as they would say, Hungarian oppression. Even though Matthias was as ethnic Romanian as one could be, but his books still survive to this day. They have been found all over from Istanbul to London, from Madrid to America, and they are still being rediscovered to this day. In the words of Marcus Tanner, the author of The Raven King, Matthias Corvinus, and the fate of his lost library, a man who, however arbitrary at times, can never be dismissed as a petty tyrant, always a builder rather than a destroyer. The fact that the remnant of his library is the only real remaining monument would have surprised no one more than him. Be nos, be nos, be Is that a power supply? That's uh, for the radio. Stick it in your mouth and put it in a wall. Yeah, yeah. Put the, put the tip in your mouth and put the blanket in the wall. Uh, what the heck is happening? <laughs> <laughs> He's becoming a god. <laughs> Look at this. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> what is that?
Hey, speaking of recharge, you get the, tell him about the coffee. Tell him about the coffee. Aaron, <laughs> you're a moron. <laughs> Bruh, why are you putting instant coffee in the coffee maker? <laughs> <laughs> As a rule of thumb, you should read the line before yours to get an establishment of how you should be acting. Yeah, that's fair. Acting is reading. Whoa. <laughs> well, I'm not reacting to anything right now. <laughs> uh. Why are you doing that? Whoa. Turk, turk. Bastard. Shut up. We're doing the next one. Turk, turk. No, I just do it like I did. No, that's autistic. That's too autistic. We're doing the next. Fine, right, just do one more for me. Oh. Alex, this is for you. Turk, Turk. <laughs> <laughs> Not so big and powerful now, Hungarian. Don't Can breathe. You not breathe? <laughs> Sorry, I had to breathe. <laughs> Shut up. I'm out of breath over here. You breathe louder than I do. I know. He's Austrian. Tonight's forecast: a freeze yeah. coming. <laughs> <laughs> Is this also condescending? Yeah, yeah, you're talking to, you just pretend you're talking to a retard, or, or a child. Mm, it's about to, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have two kitty cats, they for you. Can you not laugh? <laughs> Can you not laugh? I haven't heard that line. Is this right. funny? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to throw you something. <laughs> <laughs> Hospitaler! Faster. Hospitaler! Faster. What the frick? <laughs> <laughs> That's like a three syllable word. <laughs> hospitaler! Or how about this? We do it. What is hospitaler? It's, nice. it's a nice hospita hospitaler. It's a nice hospitaler. He's autistic. So I just say hospitaler. It's, yeah, no, you it's said hospitaler. it right. Hospitaler. He, he said it right. No, he's, he's lying. <laughs> I said it right. No. Here, how about this? Do it. Ah. Tonight's forecast. <laughs> No. <laughs> I freeze. Beanos. 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 They're Turkey? They're Turkish. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 The gingerbread man? The gingerbread man! You're Wait, the muffin man? The, mu <laughs> the muffin man! Oh, wizard, you guys! You're a monster! You're a monster! You're a monster! You're a monster. You're a monster. Not the gun drop buttons! No! <laughs> 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 Alright, thank you. Shut your- No, we're not done. <laughs>